Okay, let's start with this. How the camel is deep cocooning. Actually, the inspiration for all of this came from this little piece of cardboard. It's an original of the Larry Wall. And for a long time I was wondering, what the hell was he doing there? I mean, what, what is that? And what it says at the top is part of the cocoon. Well, apart from the misspelling, um, yeah, you could argue that Pearl 5 has been cocooning, or Pearl, I should actually say. So let's recap a little bit of the, of the past. Um, if you look at Pearl 5 between 2000 and 2010, we had 5.6 in 2000, we had 5.8 in 2002. 5.10 came in 2005, that's five years later. 2010 saw 5.12, which is three years later, but since then, we have had a yearly release of Pearl 5. So you could argue that the lean years of Pearl 5 have passed. <clears throat> if you look at Pearl 6, we've had the original Camel Herds meeting in 2000, we had the whole request for comments process. We had the apocalypsis, the exegesis, and the synopsis. Did I say that right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> we had Parrot as a virtual machine for everybody. We had Pugs, which was called 6 on Haskell, which gave us the 12 6 test suite, very important. And we now have, um, from the end of 2000, well, 2010, we have Rakuno on Parrot and Yetcha on Mono on that. And you could very arguably say that nothing there is production ready. So you could argue that the zeros were the cocooning years for Pro. Pro was very busy with itself, it was redefining itself, it was reinventing itself. So what is Pro actually? And I would argue now that BCF years have passed. So coming back to this, uh, it will not be your normal de cocooning. Because in a normal de cocoon, you have an empty shell and something new comes out. This cocoon is different as in Pearl 5 and Pearl 6, I think, will continue to coexist for a long time to come. <clears throat> so, what does Pearl 5 look like in the tents? Is that what you'd say? That? The tents. We have a new release every year. We have many organizations in Pearl 5 and a lot of internal profile, which has been very important. We have a lot of Pro 6 like features, which I will get into later. And we have a lot of Pro 6 like modules. Moose, I guess, being one of the most important ones. But also method signatures and promises. And we have a monthly development release in Pro 5. So how does it look for Pro 6 in the tents? Well, Nietzsche uh, came up very quickly and very fast. It was more feature complete initially, but it's falling behind now. We have not quite well developed, and nice thing about not quite well is that it's actually self hosting. We had six model actually implemented on NQB with multiple backends. We had Morbian, a virtual machine for Pro 6. Everything that Rakudo originally was planned to be is now more, I could argue. <clears throat> so now Rakudo runs on Parrot, JVM, and Morbian. And we also have a monthly development. So, will these continue to coexist? I, yes, they will. But I think that those six will become much more important and more future proof, and therefore become larger. <clears throat> so, what are the cool, cool six features in Pro 5? Well, it said, well, you know, let's say yada yada yada, state variables, define four electrical subs, subroutine signatures. A lot of these things from Pro 6 work in Pro 5, and as long as they don't involve types, they generally work in Pro 5. <clears throat> so, in these examples that I'm going to give you now, I made a little alias for Pro 5, capital E and Pro 6, small e. It makes it smaller and it makes a lot more less typing. <clears throat> so, if we look at this in Pro 5, we have a print and we have a save. 
in other bank, it puts a new line for you after it. And how does that look in Pulse 6? Exactly the same. So, win, I guess. Um, what do we have here? We call 5, we do the yada 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 here, and we run the subroutine, and it stops with saying it's unimplemented. If you put something like this into try to do the variable, it's actually a syntax error. So it's the yada 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 is not complete like the yada yada of pull five, uh, pull six. Yeah. <coughs> uh, in pull six, if you do it like that, it's stub code executed. It's not an implemented stub code executed, but it works the same way. However, if you try to put this into a variable, it actually works. It's actually valid code. And what we put into the variable is that's the way of actually asking for what something is in the variable, the what method, actually macro, but method, something, thingy. thingy. <laughs> uh, it's a failure. So we put a failure in the variable. Does that mean anything? Well, the moment that you actually look at the value of the variable, like in a say, it will actually find out, oh, hang on, this is wrong. Something happened here. So you can delay failures in Pro 6. And uh, that's a very useful feature, especially if you're going asynchronous. <clears throat> the familiar state variable in Pro 5, well, that's very nice. We have a sub here, and we start at 10, and we say from 0 to 9, and you get 11 to 30. Very nice, very easy. It's the same in Pro 6. Um, the way you specify ranges is a little bit different. You can say 0 to correct 10. This basically means go to 10, but don't take the last one. So it's just 9. Um, <clears throat> this is the defined OR. So we have two variables. One is undefined, one has a value. The defined OR will give you the second one if the first one is undefined. And the normal OR will give you uh, if the first one is false. So in this case, we're going to put zero in here. The final OR will give you zero, and the second one will give you two point. Very useful to have that. And I know people that actually backported it to earlier versions of Pool Five just because they wanted to have it there. And in Pool Six, it's not different. So that's one. Nice backport of a Pro 6 feature to Pro 5. <clears throat> lexical subroutines. Does anybody know what a lexical subroutine is? Yay! <laughs> anyway, in Pro 5, you can uh, now say my sub, which basically means that you only have a sub that exists inside this code. So you can run it here, which takes you to Pro. If you run it outside of the scope, it doesn't know about it. Which can be very handy to make sure that the things are only visible in the area that you uh, actually need them. Um, so this, this is about the same as just saying this. And so it just, it's definitely, it finds out that runtime that you actually could call this. Now if you compare this with 2.6, all lexicals are, all subs are lexical. So I don't have to do anything special here. I have a sub A here. I can call the A here. And I call the A outside of this code. But this will never run. Because Pro 6 already at compile time figures out that this subroutine call will never work. Because it doesn't exist there. So it will never run. It will take a compile time, which is a huge win if you're actually misspelling names and you find out like five minutes into the run of your program that you misspelled something. Good that you know it in advance. These are the new feature of Part 520 in Pro 5. They're called signatures. You can actually specify in the area where you would normally do a prototype, you can now specify a signature. So the first Parameter, positional parameter that you pass to the subroutine will be become part, will be stored in a variable called f, and all of the rest.
rest of the name parameters we could put into a hash. So if I call this subroutine with bar and, and basically a hash, I get these two things. Now, <clears throat> in code 5, you will still also have an underscore. Even if you say, uh, give the signature, an underscore will still exist. So this, the whole signature thing is just synthetic sugar for you. It doesn't really do anything apart from that. It just makes sure that it does all sorts of things for you. So the, the huge overhead that you have for actually actually creating at underscore and every subroutine calls to exist. So there's no runtime effect of using signatures, it's just for your convenience. Yes. I know it's a door F. I know lexical. Yeah. Those are lexicals inside your subroutine, yeah. Automatic. You don't have to specify them with MITRE, automatically it exists inside your subroutine. In full 6, you can do the same like we did here. You have to call this a slurry hash, hence the star in front of it. You can do the same thing. However, if you specify that underscore here, it will actually at compile time say, uh uh, you can't do that. In full 6, and underscore is only created if you actually use it inside a subroutine, and then it automatically creates a signature for you. Since I've already specified a signature here, you actually cannot have that in there. And that's a good thing, because you probably don't want to use at underscore in here anymore if you actually take the trouble of using signatures. So what are the problematic Pro6 features in Pro5? Well, the standard async thing means that we have a Pro5 uh, are based on high threads. We have promises, but they're uh, based on an event loop that you need to actually have in your program. Uh, the smart match um, doesn't work because we have type problems in Pro5. We don't know what something is, so we don't know what the smart match is supposed to do. So it's going to be deprecated. And super team signatures are limited and they are only synthetic sugar. So that only goes to show that if you pull on stuff on a laser where you didn't actually take it into account in it, in it, from the start, it's always hard. So, standard async, we have high threads. Um, it suffers from a flawed implementation. If you really want to know what's wrong with both high threads, uh, contact me after the talk. <clears throat> But there's no real alternative for it. Um, it's basically using the fork emulation that was intended to work on Windows. Um, yeah, it's another way of doing threads, but it started as a joke, and I think still is in the end. Uh, but you should really realize that if you want to program threads, you're actually doing something that is sort of superhuman. And, and I think in that respect, it's very important to remember our old friend, Kunigan, Brian Kunigan, uh, who stated in his programming C book, if I remember correctly, uh, debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are, by definition, <coughs> not smart enough to debug it. And this is very true if you program with threads. Um, you're always uh, yeah, working on your toes if you're programming threads. So you should be programming threads yourself. <coughs> Build 5 also has a promise module. It's asynchronicity for non uh, It's available as a secret module, but it needs an event loop. And you can usually only have one event loop in your program. And if you have one, one set of modules that uses one event loop and you want to have you know, another event loop, then you're in trouble. In trouble. And Probably the promises are not really asynchronous to begin with. It just gives you the impression of being asynchronous. So even though you have eight cores, you're still just using one core. It's just not what you want. <coughs> In Pro 5 Smart Match, well, you need typing really to make Smart Match work. Uh, Pro 5 most likely will never have typing. Reba, are you okay? Uh, it depends, okay. Well, <laughs> depends how much funding is available. Yeah, exactly. So, um, 
spin of limited usefulness has been a source of confusion it will find, and therefore it's going to be deprecated. So um, this is one of the uh, failed experiments of porting back from six features to four five. And it's hurting, I can tell you. Um, student two signatures, well they're not here yet, they will be in May. Syntax sugar. Um, in pool six, signatures are part of something called multi vendor dispatch. I'll give you a little example of that later. Uh, but it's very nice to have nonetheless. I mean, one of the things that made pool five look like an old language is because you actually had to always do something like my this and that is at underscore. And you don't have to do that anymore. So in that, in that sense, it's very good to have. So, give an example of uh, signatures in pool six. This is a way of specifying a name parameter and a default for the name parameter. So if I just call it without a name parameter, it says, hey you, and then I follow with Utrecht, it says, hey Utrecht. And that's just the way to do it. <clears throat> now, what is the fact is this, you might ask. Well, this is, this is what you know. I guess in pool 5, it's called a fat comma, and in pool 6, we call this a pair. And if you look at the Perl code for that, it's actually using the fat comma notation for it. This is just the same way of saying this here, using the uh, angle bracket here, uh, which basically means quote this, and that's a what, it's a pair. And the Perl is the same thing. So these are just a quicker way of saying this. It's less typing. And it's more consistent. You can use this everywhere where you use name parameters or pairs or whatever. Uh, this is an example of multi method, uh, multi, multi sub dispatch in this case. Um, Short way of saying that we have multiple units, of, uh, multiple subs of the same name. We say multi A, multi A, and we give it a different signature. So this one accepts numbers, this one accepts strings. In this case, I just say number, that number, and here's that string, that string. And I'll now call this same subroutine with 42 over the string. I get number 42 and string foo. So that makes it very easy for you to actually handle different parameters and uh, it just makes different subs for them. You don't actually have to think about it yourself anymore. This is a very powerful thing. So, <clears throat> and why is that a powerful thing? In pool 6 you can just say my dollar a equals two, and you say it and it works. You can say this is a number and I put foo into it and you say it, it says type shift. I check change in assignment. I expected a num, I got a string. No go. Because a num, a string is not a num. Right? But if you say a string here, it just works. So this is the thing called gradual typing. You can put in the types that you want and it will check for you. Will it actually make things slower when you do this? Uh, no, because we actually if you don't specify anything here, it actually says my any dollar a. And num is any and string is any, so it works. So you don't get any penalty for uh, adding types. In fact, you're helping any optimizer code to actually optimize your stuff away in such a way that it actually goes faster. So if you can use type, you should use type. And you probably should get used to it. And the feature that if you put something wrong in there and it will bomb on you is very useful. Is, it, is this still some conversion though? In the sense that, uh, for instance, number six is representable as string. Yes. But it, that gives me a percent that string, it's actually not there. There, there is um, a spec that will uh, allow you to specify that if something <laughs> comes in from that. And you want to actually automatically coerce it, you can do that, but it's not been implemented. Okay. And there's been just some discussion whether or not that should be implemented. But six one. They <laughs> <laughs> uh, play constraints, so non coercion is the, the key. Okay, but 
like basic yeah. constraints. Yeah. So what are the Perl 5 features in Perl 6? We have the Perl 5 intro object, uh, project and we have USV5. Uh, but it, of course it always stays hard to, to integrate something or mimic something that actually does not have a description. The only description of Perl 5 that exists is Perl 5 running Perl 5 and finding out what something does. There is no official description for it. <clears throat> This Perl 5 interrupt, the idea of that uh, is that you can actually run a Perl 5 interpreter inside the Kudo or Morphium. So you can actually get access to all Perl 5 code out there, including the modules with access, and you would be able to call Perl 5 code from Perl 6 and vice versa. There's only one problem. Uh, this project has been, seems to have stalled and there's no ETA. Um, even though there's a nice ground waiting for him, he's not doing it anymore, and we don't know exactly why. No. Okay. And then we have USB 5, which is the other thing. It's basically uh, original by uh, Larry Wall himself, now it's done by Tobias Leich, aka Frogs. And it's basically like Pro 6 is implemented using NQP and grammars and Pro 6. And it's re implementing Perl 5 in the same way. So, create a grammar for Perl 5 that creates the ASDs and just basically use the same runtime as Perl 6. Um, that's gone quite a, a long way, um, but it will never allow access, at least not as we know it. And it will allow you to pull Perl 5 code for Perl 6 because it internally is just the same code, so there's no difference in it. And it now passes about 10% of the Perl 5 test suite. Now, the big, biggest problem there, of course, is that there's so much code in the core of Perl that is access code and that will never run. So there's a huge part of the test suite that will actually just never pass. So 10% it, it, doesn't look like a lot, but it's actually quite a lot, if you think about it. So if you look at it for uh, what we need for Perl 6 adoption, in the future. I think we need a good introduction ebook. We need more modules of CPAT support. Actually, at the moment, you can already upload Pro 6 distributions to CPAT. Uh, you can't download or install them yet, but it's very important that um, the whole um, architecture that we have on CPAT for testing, for grading, for dependencies, and everything uh, is not being. Uh, uh, not, I wouldn't say destroyed, but uh, being inconvenienced by Perl 6 modules that do not compile in Perl 5 and stuff like that. So we can now upload Perl 6 distributions to CPAN and they will be ignored, which is a good thing, but they are already disappeared everywhere in the world if you can do that. <coughs> and we need better performance for Perl 6. Now, a good introduction ebook. Um, I was. Um, <clears throat> Rumor has it that a certain someone is working on that. A certain someone who wrote a camel book a long time ago. Um, but that's just a rumor. Um, so if you feel like writing your Perl 6 book or, or blog about it, please do. Let us know that you did. We'll like you to the, the whole uh, Planet 6 uh, feed of blogs and you'll get exposure. Um, we're going to need more modules and CPAN support. Uh, installing from CPAN should be uh, pretty soon, I, mean, I guess around the bonus Perl workshop in a few weeks. I'm going to put the dots on the I there. And there's going to be a NAS work, and it's probably in September, where we really start supporting CPAN modules uh, to Perl 6. And of course, this is not to stop anybody from starting to do that right now. <clears throat> uh, the better performance part, Morbium is now completely standalone. Um, the performance of Morbium is creeping towards Perl 5, I would say. Um, the start of Perl 5 plus moves is now about the same as Perl 6 on Morbium. And we actually now can officially say that we have a Google Server code project to develop a JIT for Morbium. 
And what that means is that it all goes well. By the end of the summer, more VM will be so small that when it can, it will actually compile down to machine code. Am I saying that correctly? Kind of. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Plus, yeah. And I guess when that happens, uh, we're going to see some, I want to do some nice benchmark tests with Profile again. Is there an update with the value of is there a what date? An update with Flavio Sperito, which was a compiler that compiled six. Um, as, as far as I know, um, Flavio was still working on Polito. I saw recently a, a number of commits pass by again. Um, but he's not on the Pearl 6 channel. He seems to be working completely uh, on his own on this. I don't know if there is a channel for Polito. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure about the state of Polito. So, I would more see that as, as a think tank type of project rather than anything in production. Yeah, it's also part of the core, part of some set of the core of five. The last time I heard of it, so. basically taking the same approach that the D5, use D5 does by um, um, using a grammar to uh, interpret the five code. Yeah. So in that sense, it's the same, but it's not NQP based at all. And so he doesn't have the benefit of, uh, if, if you have NQP running on a, on, a, on a virtual machine, you basically have, almost have Pro 6 running on it as well. Right, so you don't actually need to port whole languages, where in his case, more or less is. And he's now, you know. The, the nice thing being that V5 is built on top of it, meaning that V5 can work on the JVM. And, yeah, uh, exactly. But it, not one of the nice ideas that he has, and that, that's to an extent, uh, I, didn't, I didn't mention it here, but there has been a project to actually target JavaScript as a backend for NTP. Yeah. And, and that's, that's uh, one of the backends that he has, so you can actually run Perl 5 or Perl 6 in your browser. Yeah. And that, that would be very nice. Uh, and there is a project still sort of going, it's sort of sleep mode at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Who knows what happens? No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, so basically the guy doing this first has to get his degree and then he can actually work on this again. So, yeah, well, that's life for you. Um, so why would you use Proof 6 in production? I think most importantly it is a saner explicit, explicit multi-core programming uh, concept with channels and promises and supplies. The supplies part you saw this morning with Jonathan if you were there. Um, it will have no versioning issues with modules. This is very important for production. If one module is using another module of a particular version, it will never interfere with a, a third module using the, an, uh, the same module with another version because everything you do with modules is only visible inside the scope that you use the module. This is very, very important. This is a very big difference between 12.6 and 12.5. In 12.5, if you load a module, it is global for everything in your process. In 12.6, it is only visible inside the scope that you actually use it. Outside there, it's not visible. I'll give you an example. So, all these cool features, I think, will make happier programmers. <laughs> That's important for management, I think. <coughs> so, to give an example of implicit uh, asynchronousy, which, by the way, is actually not yet implemented in Pro 6 at this point, but we now have all the primitives to be able to do that if you want to. This is, what is this? Well, it's one or two or three. And in Pro 6, you say it like that. It's any of these. It's basically a quantum superpositions of Daniel Conway, but it's integrated into the language. So <clears throat> if you say it's one, two, or three, is this true? Well, you get this. Is any of these true or false? Well, that's true, of course. So if you want to boolean out of that, it's true. Right? 
So <clears throat> now let's say that I want to have a random number between 0 and 999, 999 inclusive. This is short for that. We just leave off the zero dot dot and you say that. Give me a random number, like 718. Um, so, if I have my dollar A, it's any from 0 to 99. And I say, is this 718? Is, is, sorry, is this any from 999? Is that this random, any of the, that random number? It will actually have to go out, of course, and test each one of them. And normally in a program, you would do this sequentially. Because it's going to be true. Is it not? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> now, if this is a thousand, the random number, there's only one the chance of one in ten that it's true. So it actually has to go out and try all of them. And that still works, but it could also be false. And this is a case where we actually, in the future, Impulse 6 will actually automatically for you thread out and make it uh, just do a parallel. And the first one that gives you a true result will be the one. And it in this case, uh, it gives you the result, and it will give you that very quickly. Maybe use more CPU, but we have plenty of that because we have plenty of force. So this is another example of this. Suppose we have a little uh, piece of work, ten of them, and in this case, I just uh, saying this is a random sleep, and I just print the number that I get here. Right, so. If I run this, it will just print those numbers, and in real time it will take about five seconds, and it will use so much CPU. Right. Now, if you want to do this in Pro 6, but in parallel, you make this into a promise. This is the start <coughs> function. It makes this a promise and just goes off somewhere and does it for you. And you want to wait until all of these promises are finished. So the result of the for loop, we get into the await. And the result is a list of promises, and the await takes all the promises and waits for all of them to actually have finished. So the order in which these things are done is not the same anymore. But if that's not important for you, this might be important because now it only takes 1.2 seconds instead of 5.4. And it only takes marginally more CPU. So, if you have plenty of CPUs and you don't have a lot of time, this is the way to do it. And this works. It is as easy as it gets for you, Pro 6. Now, with regards to uh, modules, uh, so there is a test module in Pro 6. It's just called use test, and it will give you an OK sub, and you can actually put a value in there, and it will give this comment. So if you do this, you get this. Very simple. <clears throat> now, if you go to the use test here inside its own scope, the OK is only known inside the scope here. There's no OK outside of it. So you get an error. And not only will you get an error at runtime, you get an error at compile time because it's already passed at compile time that you don't have an OK there. But this is where it gets very uh, important. Whenever you use a module, it only is seen inside the scope that you actually use it. So if somebody would write another test module, I could use that in the same script as long as I use them in different scopes. This is very important for production. Yes? Just a question. I thought you specifically disallowed this kind of syntax that you have to say which test I'm using, or that's not the case. Like you switch test if you have. Oh, yeah, yeah that, but I don't want to go into that right now. It's just that the scoping is the most important thing here. Uh, the fact that you can have uh, different tests by authority or version. 
is now an issue, but you can specify it in the use statement and say, I want to have use test version one here, and in another block, I want to have use test version two. But I was going for the visibility aspect here. <clears throat> okay, so how can you try build six right now? Well, it's very easy. You go into your machine, you make a directory, you do a git clone, you do a cd into the directory, you do this, you get more, it goes click, 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 click. You say make install, it goes click, 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 click. And you have a pro 6 in your install bin directory. That's all you need to do with pro 6. If you want to get support, we have a very good channel on irc 3 org pro 6 channel, very friendly folks there. There's a lot of examples in the uh, Rosetta code project for Pill 6. There's a place where you get all the blogs. There is an article if you're going from Pill 5 on ProGeek.de. Some other nice articles there as well, by the way. And if you want to get into the nitty gritty, there's all the synopsis, which basically is the specification of Pill 6 that you can find there. So, this is, I think, how the camel is decocooning in the coming years, and right now, actually. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I, I kind of know, I guess. Uh, in uh, Python 3.3 or 3.4, uh, it's strongly typed by so and really typed, and uh, which when you were talking about the um, your signatures, uh, and something they had in Python because a lot of people asked for it was in the, when you're naming your parameters, you can make a suggestion like, I'm kind of expecting this kind of type, but they're just suggestions. And then when the, when the function runs, it, it, it kind of, uh, it, I guess it's an optimization that, okay, because you said that I'm expecting a number for this parameter, I'm expecting uh -huh. this other one. Is that something that could be added to Pro 5 to make that a little more useful than just sugar? Um, you, you wouldn't know. Not, not actual typing, but like suggestions. There have been very large discussions about this on C5P. Have you looked at what? And the, 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 the thing is, well, uh, I'm not, I'm only casually following uh, both of P5P. But uh, my impression was that it was, it couldn't reach an agreement on what it should do and uh, what effect it would have on, on, on uh, backwards compatibility and performance. Well, the backwards compatibility, if you, you know, just yeah, well, you want to stay there. Maybe we should. I don't think we should redo the whole discussion. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a huge discussion, and the, the, the thing that, in the end, everybody agreed on, we need at least to have like the synthetic sugar right now. So that's what's going to happen five twenty. Who knows what's going to happen five twenty two? But that's the situation here. Uh, we have now a Pro 6 running on the JVM. Um, we talked about the modules that you can specify with some fluency and version. Yeah. Does it mean that uh, um, memory wise, to the very single to Java, that you will need a lot of memory to run Pro 6? Well, that's the thing. If you load two different modules, yeah, that's uh, they so will take up memory. Yes. In that case, so. Yeah. But I, I, in, in general, I would say towards the future, I think memory is uh, the Problem is the problem that CPUs are not getting faster; we're just getting more of them. So you can't have your cake and eat it while maybe you can. <laughs> more questions? Upcoming signatures in five twenty. Is there any runtime checks to make this signature, or is it just a convenient way to? It's just a convenient way. It's syntactic sure. It will basically just internally uh, map at underscore to my dollar or whatever. It just will do that for you. That's, that's about it. But if you don't pass in the parameters, in the arguments, say you take two parameters and pass one argument. Uh, but those uh, checks are uh, still. Yeah, yeah. you have to compile yeah. and add right. right. They'll probably wind up with that underscore and not be used. No, no it will be like. Okay. Yeah, well, too uh, I, I would have to look at that. So, well, uh, I guess uh, I should take it down. So, thank you very much, and uh, I would say thank you for the white camel. Yeah.